Hey everyone, it's Thanksgiving week and everyone is talking about eating turkey, stuffing, and cranberry, but today on Mother Knows Death, we will be talking about eating people. On today's external exam, we will examine cannibalism. Mother Knows Death presents External Exams with Nicole and Jemmy. First, let's discuss what is cannibalism. Cannibalism is when one species of animal eats the same species for food. So, for example, if your dog eats dog meat for dinner. The same can also be said for humans eating other humans. Cannibalism always makes me think about the first time I saw an autopsy. I always joke that this job doesn't gross me out and that I could eat a hamburger over a dead body, but the first time I saw an autopsy, I felt a little bit differently. I mean, after all, when you cut open a human, it's the same as cutting open an animal. And when I saw the human ribs, I was not able to eat Chinese spare ribs for a really long time. So cannibalism has been documented throughout history and many different cultures all over the world. Most of the time, cannibalism is frowned upon, but in some societies, it's totally normal. There's a book by the American Museum of Natural History titled Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History, and it discusses how during the Chinese Yan Dynasty, royalty and upper-class citizens dined on various different types of prepared humans that were baked, roasted, broiled, smoke-dried, and sun-dried. Children were considered the tastiest, followed by women, and last, men, and I would venture to say this is because of fat content. This remained widespread in China into the late 1960s. These humans did not eat each other out of necessity. They did it because they thought people tasted good. And then there is Rick Gibson. Rick Gibson's a Canadian sculptor and a performance artist. In 1988, Rick was given preserved human tonsils in alcohol by a friend. He was hoping to make a pair of earrings out of these tonsils, but instead he decided to eat them. On July 19, 1988, he stood on a corner in London, put the tonsils on a cracker with some spread and a garnish, and ate them in public. About a year later, on April 15, 1989, he publicly ate a slice of human testicle in London. A few months later, he tried to do it again in Vancouver, but the testicle hors d'oeuvre was confiscated by Vancouver police. He later tried again and successfully ate another slice of human testicle. I really cannot tell you why Rick Gibson ate human meat other than he was a starving artist. Get it? In fact, there are many reasons why a person decides to eat human flesh. Let's talk about the different types of cannibalism. Cannibalism can be broken down into three main categories. Cultural. Throughout history, some cultures would eat the remains of people in their tribe as part of the grieving process or because of cultural superstitions. Endocannibalism. The Korowai tribe. The Korowai tribe from New Guinea, Indonesia, is thought to be one of the last tribes who still practice cannibalism. The Korowai live deep in the rainforest, and many of them have never seen an outsider. Many members of the tribe are completely unaware of our modern world and have no knowledge of disease, germs, or accidental deaths. Few outsiders have been able to observe the Korowai tribe and their cannibal practices. The Korowai believe that mysterious deaths that happen in their village are a result of the Kekwa, a witch that takes over the form of man. The tribe believes that this witch wants to kill people and comes disguised dressed as a friend or relative. They think that this witch invades their loved ones and then eats their insides while they sleep and replaces their insides with fireplace ash so they do not know they are being eaten. Then the witch shoots a magical arrow into the heart and kills them. When a member of this tribe dies or is about to die, it is the duty of the Korowai tribe to seize and kill the Kakwa witch. Once they kill one of their own tribe members who they believe had been taken over by the Kekwa, they treat the body like they would treat the flesh of a pig. They cut off the legs separately and wrap them in banana leaves. They cut off the head and it is given to the person who found the Kekwa. 
Then they cut off the right arm and the right ribs as one piece and the left as another. They eat everything except the hair, nails, and you guessed it, the penis. Children under 13 are not allowed to eat it because they believe eating the kekwa is dangerous and the evil spirits all around make children too vulnerable. If you asked a member of the Korowai tribe why they eat humans, they would argue and tell you that they do not eat humans. They only eat kekwa. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Four tribe. In some cultures, consuming the meat of a dead person is done with the intent of taking on some of the traits of the dead person. The Four tribe, also from New Guinea, would cook and eat family members after they died, which was thought to invoke the spirit of the dead. And in some sense, they were doing just that. Women and children were primarily consuming the brains of the dead family members. And you should never eat brains. Why? Because of prion disease. Prions are not the classic organism we think about when we think about transmissible diseases like viruses and bacteria. Prions are abnormal proteins that can cause transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, which is similar to mad cow disease, but in people. Prion disease has a long incubation period. It can be years or decades before a person starts to show symptoms after exposure. Even though this tribe stopped eating their dead family members in the 1960s, tribe members started popping up with an unusual disease called Kuru years later. Kuru is a prion disease and was mostly found in women and children of the tribe because they were mostly eating the brains during the rituals. Now we're going to move on to exocannibalism. This is the consumption of a person outside of a community, usually a celebration of victory against a rival tribe. Necrocannibalism. This type of cannibal eats an already dead person to survive. Now we're going to talk about one of the most famous cases of this, which is Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. Would you eat another person to save your life? In 1972, a college rugby team from Uruguay chartered a Uruguayan Air Force plane to take the team from Montevideo, Uruguay to Santiago, Chile. The flight initially left Uruguay with 40 passengers and five crew members. Due to the poor weather conditions in the Andes Mountains, the flight had to land and stay overnight in Mendoza, Argentina. They were cleared to leave the next afternoon. The flight departed at 2.18 p.m. and just after 3 p.m., air controllers then cleared the plane for descent but shortly after lost communication with the plane. The pilot had misjudged the location of the plane, which was still in the Andes, and crashed around 3.30 p.m. As the plane tumbled down the mountain, it lost both its wings, the tail cone, and part of the fuselage, which is the central part of the plane where the passenger and crew sits. The remainder of the plane eventually slid down into a snowbank in a remote valley of Argentina near the border of Chile. Twelve people died during the initial crash with 33 left to survive the harsh conditions of the mountains. Shortly after the crash, a search rescue was underway with no luck, as clearly the pilot misjudged their initial location. Rescue teams quickly looked to the Andes. However, the snow-covered mountains made it incredibly difficult to spot the remains of a white aircraft. After eight days, the search was called off with the assumption that there were no survivors. Over two months after Flight 571 crashed, the remaining survivors were finally rescued on December 22, 1972. Out of the 33 people who survived the initial crash, only 16 survived. So how did they survive? Survivors of the initial crash got to thinking quickly and used parts from the plane, such as seat, luggage, debris, etc., to create sufficient shelter. They relied on additional clothing found in luggage to keep as warm as possible. While most of the plane's fuselage was intact, it did not provide much relief from the harsh weather conditions and eventually killed an additional eight passengers sleeping inside when an avalanche hit. For about a week, the remaining survivors were able to eat any leftover food on the aircraft. This mostly involved candy and wine, but quickly they ran out. From here, they were desperate and resorted to eating cotton and leather from the plane seats. It was clear after a week that rescue efforts were not sufficient and the remaining survivors were willing to do anything to live. 
Robert Kisena, a survivor who was 19 at the time of the crash, stated in his memoir, quote, We knew the answer, but it was too terrible to contemplate. The bodies of our friends and teammates, preserved outside in the snow and ice, contained vital, life-giving protein that could help us survive. But could we do it? Initially, the survivors had deep moral concerns about eating the deceased as they were all devoted Catholics. Later in the media, one survivor claimed that they were influenced by the Last Supper in which Jesus gave his disciples bread and wine that he stated were his body and his blood. This perspective helped with the media backlash after survivors revealed that they resorted to cannibalism. On day nine, the difficult decision was made and a pact was formed that if any of them died, they could eat the deceased for sustenance. Robert used broken glass from a window to cut off frozen flesh from the deceased. They decided to consume the pilot and co-pilot first as they were strangers. Two months after the crash, Robert and another survivor decided to take their own journey in search of help. After days of hiking with no map or supplies, they got the attention of some men across a river. The men alerted authorities and the remaining survivors were rescued. Now we're going to get into this historical case of cannibalism, the Donner Party. In another case of survival cannibalism, a group of American pioneers headed west on the Oregon Trail in hopes of a better life, but unfortunately were left trapped in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Journeys on the Oregon Trail typically lasted four to six months and came with great risk. About 10% of voyagers did not make the journey west. The Donner Party originating in Illinois departed Missouri on the Oregon Trail in the spring of 1846. The group of 87 decided to go on a relatively new path, Hastings Cutoff, which was an alternative route for those seeking settlement in California. Many peers advised the group against taking the alternative route, stating that the terrain was not suitable for wagon travel. This new route extended the time of the journey and created many issues down the line. The rugged terrain along this trail caused the loss of wagons and horses, further slowing down the journey. By November, the group reached the Sierra Nevada mountains. As a result of poor planning, they became trapped by heavy snowfall with little supplies. About a month after becoming trapped, 15 of the settlers ventured out in search of help. Several days of wandering the snowy terrain left them weak and starving. They even contemplated human sacrifice or a duel between the two men. Fortunately for them, some of the group members died from natural causes and left them with enough food to regain strength. Seven of the 15 members who ventured from the remaining stranding group made it to California and formed a rescue plan for the others. Of the 87 original group members that left in the spring of 1843, 48 survived. Today's episode is brought to you by Artery Inc. Artery Inc is my favorite company that sells apparel for medical professionals. And the reason that it's my favorite is because They represent more obscure professions in the field of medicine. For example, when I was in PA school, I had a terrible time finding a shirt that said that I was a pathologist assistant, and I was so proud of going to school for that. My classmates and I, we always wanted shirts that said it, but when we went to the bookstore, they just had shirts that said nurses or doctors. And sorry, nurses and doctors, but there are way more people working in the hospital that are doing things to help save people's lives as well. And we want to be represented too. So that's why I love Artery Inc. They also are a woman owned business and so are we. So we love to support that. And they give back to the community. And last year they donated over $36,000. So check out their website, arteryinc.com, where you could pre-order your pathologist assistant or PA shirt along with other shirts. And they also have other shirts that are available for immediate shipping. And their discount code for 15% off of the order is loveyourinsides23. 
And another great thing about this company is that they draw all their own designs. So there's just so many reasons why you want to support them. Again, arteryinc.com, 15% off of your order. Love your insides, 23. Okay, let's get into homicidal cannibalism. This type of cannibal kills a person and then eats their dead body. This brings us to the whole point of this post. Most people eat turkey and stuffing on Thanksgiving, but this woman ate her husband for Thanksgiving. It was a whirlwind romance between Omima, a 23-year-old Egyptian model, and her husband, 56-year-old Bill Nelson. In late 1991, Omema met Bill, who was a pilot, after living in America for about five years. A few days after meeting, the two married, and things would turn deadly in only a month. In their brief relationship, Omema claimed that Bill had sexually assaulted her, and after an attack on November 28, 1991, which was Thanksgiving Day, she had enough. She stabbed Bill in his chest and stomach with a pair of scissors and finished him off with a clothing iron. In a moment of blind rage, Omema began to cut up Bill's body. She even castrated him, which is removing his testicles, as a revenge for the times he abused her. Omema spent hours attempting to get rid of Bill's remains. She mixed some of his body parts with turkey leftovers to disguise them in a trash bag, shoved other bits down the garbage disposal, which neighbors told investigators they heard running for hours, and eventually boiled his hands in an attempt to remove fingerprints. She then stuck his head in the freezer to deal with him later. Now, this is where the crime really takes a turn. Court documents detailed a conversation between Omema and her psychiatrist. In the session, she admits that she, quote, did his ribs just like in a restaurant. It is so sweet. It's so delicious. I like mine tender. She actually took Bill's ribs, which she dismembered after the murder, and cooked them in barbecue sauce and ate them for dinner. She was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison, and she will be eligible for parole in 2026. So you know she'll probably get released and get some kind of a cookbook deal or something. Okay, on to Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer has been more in the limelight as of late and is arguably the most famous cannibal. Jeffrey killed his first victim at the young age of 18 in 1978. This crime took place in his childhood home and he hid the remains in the crawl space underneath of his house. It would be almost a decade before his next murder while living in his grandmother's house. All in all, Dahmer was thought to have killed 17 men but was only convicted for 15. He was eventually caught in 1991 after one of his victims escaped and drew attention to the haunting scene in his Milwaukee apartment. Dahmer's apartment had been recounted as one of the most horrific scenes in true crime history. When police searched the apartment, they found the remains of 11 men. Dahmer had a 57-gallon barrel in his bedroom filled with hydrochloric acid to dissolve the skin off of his victim's skeletons. At the time of his arrest, police found three torsos dissolving in the acid. Also in his bedroom was a drawer full of Polaroids showing the deceased victims and acts of necrophilia, which is sex with a dead person. He once stated he took the photos to remember the beauty each victim once had. Dahmer kept a reserve of some body parts in his freezer to cook. There were also three decapitated heads and a human heart in his refrigerator at the time of discovery. While Dahmer never denied his killings, he could never fully explain what drove him to start eating the body parts. He stated, quote, At first it was just curiosity, then it became compulsive. He also noted to investigators that biceps tasted like beef. Dr. Eric Hickey, a professor of forensic psychology, explains cannibalism as the ultimate form of control over a victim, commenting that, quote, eating their victims gives them a sense of power because their victims can never leave. Dr. Hickey goes on to explain that cannibalism is often the result of obsessive sexual desire and experimentation. He says, quote, you don't usually see people jump from killing to eating. It starts with watching people sleep, then drugging victims. Then you want to be with someone who's buried or unconscious, and then it progresses from there. 
Jeffrey Dahmer was known for drugging his victims, and he was even banned from certain clubs and bathhouses for doing it. Based on Dr. Hickey's explanation and Dahmer's admitted compulsiveness, it definitely makes sense that Dahmer would progress to this horrific behavior. Jeffrey Dahmer was sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences in 1992, but he was beaten to death by a fellow inmate in 1994. Ed Gain Going back a few decades, the search for a local missing woman would lead police to a truly horrific crime scene. In November 1957, a local hardware store owner, Bernice Warden, went missing. This was an incredibly rare instance for the time, especially in such a small town. The only clue left behind was bloodstains. Police looked through her records from the store, and the last receipt that she wrote out for the day was a man named Ed Gain, who went into the store to purchase antifreeze. Police went to Gain's house, who lived in an isolated farm right outside of town, and immediately found Bernice. She was decapitated and hanging by her ankles. The farmhouse was filled with bones, human organs, and even crafts and furniture made from human remains. Some of the items they discovered included masks made from faces, a belt made of nipples, a lampshade made from a face, a pair of lips acting as a window shade drawstring, and chairs and a pair of leggings made from human skin. Gain immediately admitted that he had kidnapped his victims in addition to robbing graves for female remains. He then told police he was trying to create a, quote, woman suit that he could wear to become his mother. She had died a decade prior and he was obsessed with her, even leaving her favorite rooms of the house boarded up to preserve their pristine condition while the rest of the house was a scene out of true crime hoarders. Does this idea of a woman suit sound familiar? Ed Gain is said to be the inspiration for Buffalo Bill in the Silence of the Lambs movie and Norman Bates in the Psycho movie. Even though those movies are fictional, it's extra scary to know it is sourced from a true story. While he never admitted it, many believe that Ed Gain participated in cannibalism. He was said to be obsessed with reading about the topic and human remains were discovered throughout his kitchen. If we approach his crimes from a psychological point of view, he had an obsessive buildup, just like Jeffrey Dahmer. His mother had died in 1945, leaving him alone in their family farmhouse. He was obsessed with her, and he slowly began to take extreme measures to resurrect her. Although police found remains from as many as 40 bodies in his home, Ed only admitted to killing two of them. He maintained that the rest of the women were from graves that he had robbed over time. These gruesome acts granted him the nickname, quote, the Butcher of Plainfield. Now let's talk about Albert Fish. Lastly, in the true crime spectrum comes the serial killer Albert Fish. While many are not as familiar with Albert Fish as Dahmer and Gain, he is thought to have influenced the character of Hannibal Lecter. At 20 years old, Fish moved to New York City where he began his life as a criminal, participating in male prostitution and raping young boys. Albert later recounted the beginning stages of his interest in sexual mutilation when a lover took him to a wax museum. At 40 years old in 1910, Albert became involved with a mentally disabled young adult. Shortly into their relationship, Albert took the man to an old farmhouse where he tortured him for two weeks. While Albert intended to kill his lover, he ended up just mutilating him by cutting off half his penis as he feared the heat would draw attention to a dead body. A few years after this incident, Albert began having hallucinations and harming himself by inserting needles into his groin. An x-ray later revealed that he had 29 needles lodged in his pelvic region. From 1919 to 1930, Albert's violent fantasies fully came to light. He began harming and murdering young children, stating that he felt God was commanding him to do so. Albert's reign of terror would eventually end with the murder of Grace Budd in 1928. Albert met Grace after her brother put an ad in the New York world seeking a job. Albert posed as a farmer looking to hire Edward, although his true intentions were to mutilate him. 
He convinced Grace's parents to have her accompanying him to a made-up party for his niece, but instead took her to an abandoned house where he killed her and then ate her. Several years later, an anonymous letter was sent to Grace's parents, and it is too disturbing to read here. Police investigated this letter, and while the beginning parts could not be verified, the events surrounding Grace's disappearance were accurate. What ultimately led police to Albert was a small detail on the envelope. There was a small emblem with the letters NYPCBA, representing New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association. A janitor for this company told investigators he had some of the stationery at his rooming house and he had left it there when he moved out. Turns out that Albert had been staying in the rooming house. Police arrested Albert at the rooming house in 1934 and he did not deny the murder. Okay, let's get into some modern day cannibalism. I think most people would find the idea of cannibalism disgusting However, cannibalism has played a role in the history of medicine, and it's still popular today. Have you ever heard of placental encapsulation? Eating your placenta has become all the rage these days. People who are pro-eating placenta say that it offers health benefits to help with postpartum depression and boost the milk supply. People like me, who are anti-eating placenta, say that humans are not cats, and it's gross, and it's cannibalism. Although cannibalism has been sensationalized in Hollywood with films like Silence of the Lambs and Dahmer, it becomes very real, disturbing, and unsettling when you learn the real facts of these cases. If you still have a taste for cannibalism, you can see the photos that go with these cases at thegrossroom.com. Cannibalism is rare, but just last year, a Michigan man was sentenced to life in prison after admitting to killing and eating the genitals of a male lover, admitting that he was involved in, quote, a violent sexual fetish. We can see the cases of Dahmer and Gain and their obsessive compulsiveness and mental disorders led them to cannibalism. But why Omema? The killing could be justified as a result of abuse, but why cook his ribs? Just because human remains can be cooked and apparently taste similar to other mammals we consume doesn't mean they should be. So, after all of this cannibalism talk, are you still craving your Thanksgiving dinner? Thank you for listening to Mother Knows Death. As a reminder, my training is as a pathologist assistant. I have a master's level education and specialize in anatomy and pathology education. I am not a doctor and I have not diagnosed or treated anyone, dead or alive, without the assistance of a licensed medical doctor. This show, my website, and social media accounts are designed to educate and inform people based on my experience working in pathology so they can make healthier decisions regarding their life and well-being. Always remember that science is changing every day and the opinions expressed in this episode are based on my knowledge of those subjects at the time of publication. If you are having a medical problem, have a medical question, or are having a medical emergency, please contact your physician or visit an urgent care center, emergency room, or hospital. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Mother Knows Death on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get podcasts. Thanks.